lovely to be here, and it's lovely. I, I haven't been back in this room in a midweek since uh, pre-COVID, I suppose, as, as this. And it's just lovely. It's been lovely actually going around a lot of the churches and been in places again and, and it feeling so much more normal than spending life on Zoom all the time as well. It's lovely to be meeting together. Uh, just want to pray just one wee minute here just as we come to God's word. Just, just let me pray. Father, as we come to your word this evening, we pray, Father, that you would take it and use it for your glory and, and speak to each one of us concerning our own souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the 24th of February this year, uh, in the Ukraine, as the Russian army moved in across northern Ukraine, life for people, in an instance, changed. Life as they knew it for many years, all of a sudden there was a change taking place that would change their lives not only for a few weeks, but maybe possibly for years and years to come. There was a lady, um, I remember watching the news in those early days of the invasion of Ukraine, and there was a lady and she said, uh, she was at, I think, a railway station. And she says, it feels like I'm living in a movie. Almost like something from the, the Second World War. Something like that there. She says, the only thing is, it's not a movie. And I'm thinking tonight about life. And how quickly it can change. Uh, it can change in an instance. Change for the Ukrainians in an instance. Health-wise. Uh, someone can be healthy and well one moment and the next, life totally changed, health gone. Wealth is also so fickle. Uh, for some people who have known lots of wealth or little wealth or whatever else, sometimes it's there and you've seen it going in people's lives as well. Popularity, what about that amongst celebrities? or personalities on TV, etc. Sometimes they're up there and something happens in their life and the next moment all has disappeared. All has changed about them. And you could go on in life, bereavement in life, an accident in life, even a car accident, something that can happen that can just change your life in an instance. I want to think tonight a wee bit about the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount. If you have a Bible, if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. And the part I'm looking at is the very uh, end of Matthew, the, or the end of, of the Sermon on the Mount. At the conclusion almost, the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. Um, some of the most famous words this world will ever know. Words that's quoted probably day and uh, day by day. Probably if you were listening to a quiz on TV or whatever else, so often something from the Sermon on the Mount is repeated. Matthew five, the sermon starts in the first verse, seeing the crowds. He says he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So the sermon is before a crowd of people. Uh, Jesus here preaching to a massive crowd of people. And of course, it's the, the Beatitudes is at the beginning of it. You can see the headings maybe in your Bible. It talks about salt and light, anger, lust, the, the sins that so much dwell within us, divorce, oaths, retaliation. And there's, there's one there, love your enemies. The complete and utter change. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, that's one of the areas that has really people are amazed at as, as, as the Christ who, who taught us to love our enemies. Christianity is so different from every other faith, every other anything in the world. And as it goes on then, of course, given to the needy, the Lord's Prayer. Where would we find a prayer that, how many times has this prayer not been said today in the world? Uh, and the thoughts of that prayer, and that whole bringing us into a relationship with God, 
or Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Uh, the name of the uh, the name Father or Abba, and the Old Testament very rarely used uh, by the, the Jewish people. In fact, when you look back and it talks about Lord and it's really Yahweh, and they they hardly even wanted to write the word. Never mind, speak it. And yet here Jesus brings us into this relationship with the Father, and our prayer is to be our Father in heaven. And he continues on with fasting, laying up treasures in, in heaven, and anxiety, judging others. And then as you come towards the, the end of it, it's usually at the very end here, verse 24, this is a little section that we usually have. We could do a children's hymn to this tonight, and you could all imagine you're back in your five or six years of age, and we could all sing about the sand that was sinking, and the rain's coming down. And yet this is not just some children's address, but it's the combination of all that's gone before it. And it's Jesus himself here brings it all to almost a finality here. And in verse 24 of chapter 7 he says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house. On a rock. Don't know how many times you've heard that. Probably in Sunday school we've heard it. Lots of times you've probably heard it. And children's addresses. The wise man built his house upon the rock. I, I don't know what you've ever imagined a house to be. It's probably, we, we imagine a house to be what we've come, what we live in. It's, that's the natural thing you would think about. You know, the wise man built his house. You maybe think about a house Maybe even think about a house like your own, and maybe it's built on a rock, say it, I don't know, round the coast somewhere, somewhere where you'd see rocks, and a house would be set in a rock and a firm foundation. But to think just for one or two wee moments, what is a house in the Middle East? Uh, one of the things you need to think about sometimes is, uh, when you're coming to a Bible passage is, what first of all did the Bible passage mean to the people who heard it first? As, as we, we, we often bring the Bible passage 2,000 years from the time of Jesus. But what did this Bible passage mean to the first hearers as Jesus spoke these words? And so when they thought about a house, how different their house, well, I live in Thornbrook, of course, how, how different is a house that's built of block or brick or cement? Most of our houses would be like that, tiles in a roof or slates. And here, a Middle Eastern house, going away back, of course, you could have had nearly anything in it. You think of the think of the story of the Pharisee, or sorry, of the not the Pharisee of the of the, the, the man who was paralysed, and they dug through the roof. Maybe maybe in your imagination, sometimes I even have. You imagine somebody digging through your roof. I hope not tonight. Whenever you're in here, because it'll be a wild mess. But a, a, a roof that we have is tiled or slain or whatever else. I was talking to a guy last night, there's a bit of building, and he was talking about how hard it is to cut a hole in a slate roof, for instance. Quite interesting, much easier to cut a hole in a tile roof. I haven't a clue about it, but I'm sure you boys, some of you know all about that. And you're maybe imagining now somebody's breaking into my house and they're coming down through the roof. But these have been flat roofs, uh, and you would have had it maybe a mixture of mud and earth and maybe uh, logs or twigs, trees, whatever, all placed with inside it. And so these would have been fragile structures to a certain degree. And you can still see them in the Middle East, some of them still today. But this fragile structure, unusually built without a foundation. So Jesus here is talking about the wise man who builds his house and doesn't just leave it anywhere, but he builds it with a foundation. He builds it with a rock. And of course, the foolish man, further down it says, he built his house on the sand. Maybe in your mind you've been thinking of Port Stewart Beach or somewhere, or the East Strand of Port Rush, and somebody lumped the house down on top of the sand. You know, that's probably maybe, I'm not saying you did do that. Sometimes I've thought that in my head. But if you think about it, remember been in the Middle East, remember been in Jordan, just not that far from where Jesus would have been speaking, and, and you would have seen some of the riverbeds that they had, or some of the, the gullies. The place, of course, was completely dry. There was no rain. It wasn't like here in Northern Ireland. But of course floods would have come. And when it rained, it really did rain. Uh, you can think of the, the story in the Bible 
uh, about the lake. And they're on the lake, and of course, up rises this uh, storm. And the disciples thought they were going to die because the storm came from the west, came down from the Mediterranean, and soaked itself right in to the middle of Israel. And so Jesus is really referring here, secondly, to a house built maybe more like on gravel, loose stones. And the boy has just left it there, thinking this is the way life's always going to be. And tonight, just want to think about that, these two builders, the builder who built on the rock, which is the rock Christ Jesus. Because of course it's not a, a physical rock he's talking about really. It's an illustration. And the house is our lives. And, and what we do with those lives. And how, where are we building those lives? What is the foundation of our house, of our lives? Remember seeing our house been built in Thornbrook and they put about five feet of foundations underneath it. You can't see it of course now. And I'm sure it's the same for many other houses in this area. A firm foundation. Something that will not move no matter what comes. And Jesus here is referring to two builders. And it's quite amazing in the Bible. The Bible never seems to refer, or very seldom, to three, four, five, six or seven. It always seems to be two. Light and darkness. The saved and the unsaved. The broad road and the narrow road. Righteous and unrighteous, the sheep and the goats. And you can continue with all those thoughts, heaven and hell. And there's always been a dividing line. And, and the, the conclusion of this Sermon on the Mount is bringing this story to a powerful thought of the foolish and the wise. And where do we stand before God? Are we wise or are we foolish? Well, I take it we're wise tonight. But when you look at actually the previous two sections of this passage that leads into this. So if you take this in context a wee bit tonight and you go from verse 15, some of the most scary passages in the New Testament are written actually just previous to this. And verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets who comes to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bush, bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. On a personal level, I don't know if you've thought much about this passage and the next one, but they are actually, uh, as a believer in Christ, very challenging. Very challenging to your own life to assure yourself, Lord, where do I stand with you? They haven't come the night to make us all doubt. I'm not meaning that. But there is a seriousness in these passages about recognising the fruit, recognising what happens in someone's life. Is there fruit? Is there, and you can only answer these questions in your own life tonight. And they really challenge me to, Lord, how true am I to you? Are you always the rock that I depend upon? Am I desiring to bear fruit for you? Or do I have any ulterior motives? In fact, verses 21 to 23 then brings out this whole thought of false prophets. And maybe it's maybe more and more with me sometimes, I think, because you speak at different things, but you really got to be so careful of not only your words, but your actions. Now, none of us, of course, are perfect in life. And Christ came to redeem us and to save us. But it does remind us, does our lives live up to the words that we profess? I, I sometimes really think about Judgment Day. Maybe again, it's maybe just with the people I'm with at times, but you're really thinking about that day that comes. Whenever you'll be before a judge, the judge of all the earth, 
and that judge who will judge us. But praise God for those who are in Christ, who are on the rug. It's the blood of Christ that saves us. It's not our own works. But at the same time, here is these people, these false prophets. When you think, for instance, Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve. You can think of Demas in the, in the New Testament. Did he preach any sermons? Possibly. He deserted Paul at one stage. Deserted the Lord, even more importantly. And so I think even as you go on longer and longer in your Christian life, just to reassure yourself before the Lord of where you stand and the things that he has you to do or the things that you, you desire to do. Why do I do what I do? And it's really very deep. It says verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's actually quite simple. It seems to be the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And it's a good question to ask yourself or ask God, Lord, what is your will for my life? Our lives go on and sometimes even drift. My own can be the same. You continually do things. Even today, involved with a lot of things to do with mission and all the rest of it. And yet, you, you, you have to be careful that it's not the will of man that you're doing, but the will of my Father who is in heaven. And it's a good question to ask God, Lord, what is your will for my life? I need to be obedient to your will. What do you want me to do? On that day, this is the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. <coughs> Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, these were clearly false prophets. And I've met people in life who have been affected by false prophets. There's a health and wealth gospel where people have been promised, if you give this, if you give that, if you give the other, look, uh, God will bless you the way he's blessed me. Totally false. Money, uh, men who are wanting money for themselves. Maybe floating around the world in some jet plane or whatever else. Others, of course, with false miracles. So that others would do whatever, look upon them in a certain way. So there's a real care here that there's nothing within us that would be false before God. And each of us has to, in many ways, this, these passages are, are about, it's almost like a communion in a way, but it's like examining your own heart. And sometimes it's really good to just stop and ask yourself before the Lord, why am I doing what I'm doing? And Lord, if there be any falsehood in me, I don't think any of these are going to be some false prophets. I'm not meaning that. But if there be falsehood in me, if there be something in me that is not right, show me, Lord. Show me my ways that are wrong and teach me your ways to follow your ways. And Jesus here, of course, in this story of the, the house built on the rock, two builders, Two foundations and two outcomes. And maybe for somebody, if they are listening to this online tonight, whatever else, think of those outcomes. Think of the outcome of your life tonight, if you're listening to this, and you don't know Christ as your saviour. Think of that as the rain fell, it says, uh, the 20, verse 25, and the rain fell, the floods come down, the winds blew and beat on that house. And this was the house that was built on the rock, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Psalm 18 verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. If you're a believer tonight in Christ, of course we're meeting here as believers, but 
even if someone's listening to this online. If you're assured that you're a, a believer in Christ tonight, the rock is Christ. The stronghold is Christ. Our fortress is Christ. And no matter what falls us or befalls us in this life, Christ is with us. I want to read to you just for a moment or two about one man. His name was Horatio Spafford. Don't know if you'll recognise the name or not. He was a prominent American lawyer. He was born in 1828. And he also happened to be a Presbyterian church elder, of all things as well. On the 5th of September 1861, he married Anna Larson in Chicago. Spafford himself invested in real estate north of Chicago. And in the spring of 1871, he made these investments. In October 1871, the Great Fire of Chicago reduced the city to ashes, something that was seen a little bit of yesterday in London with some houses, but it reduced the whole city to ashes, destroying most of Spafford's investment. Two years after the devastation of the Great Chicago Fire, the family planned a trip to Europe. Late business demands kept Spafford from joining his wife and four daughters on a family vacation in England, where his friend D.L. Moody would be preaching. On November the 22nd, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship Vilder Harve, the ship was struck by an iron sailing vessel, killing 226 people, including all of the Spafford's daughters. Annie was aged 12, Maggie was aged 7, Bessie was aged 4 and an 18-month-old baby. His wife Anna survived the tragedy. And upon arriving in Cardiff and Wales, she sent a telegram to her husband that read, Saved Alone. Shortly afterwards, a Spafford travelled to meet his grieving wife. He was inspired to write the well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, as the ship passed near where his daughter had died. The original manuscript is only four verses in it, but Spafford's daughter, who was born later, he had later three more children born, added another verse at one stage. Anna's wife, who gave birth to those three more children, however, one of those children also died at three years of age of scarlet fever. Philip Bless wrote the tune to the hymn. We're actually not going to sing this hymn tonight, but he wrote the tune to this hymn. Because I love the words of this hymn. And it's in the midst of those storms of life. And tonight as a believer in Christ. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in the rock. There is nowhere else to go. There is no one else to turn to. Spafford's words were. When peace like a river. Attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea bellows roll, and you can imagine them at sea, whatever my lot that has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. What is it like with your soul tonight? Sometimes, you know, it's just good to uh, get alone with the Lord. There's a girl I know who works in missions, uh, she was talking to Wally me one day on the, the Lisburn Road a couple of weeks ago. She's actually a, 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 a woman who would spend a lot of time in prayer. And uh, she works for another, she works for a mission agency, but she was talking about working, but she was talking about dwelling, about being with Christ. And recently she has taken to be spending, she says, much, much more time just being in his presence. There's something about it. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. That's what he's done for you and me. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, 
is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And that last verse, And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, that amazement. The clouds shall be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. How is it with your soul tonight? And if you're going through the trials, as many people do, and all those things I talked about earlier, this can even come in an instance. One of the lovely things is to know that all is well with our soul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we come to the one tonight who is none other than the rock, Christ Jesus. Lord, even some of these words in the, the scriptures in 1 Samuel 2 and 2, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our rock in this life. Help us, Lord, to spend more time with that rock. To spend more time even alone with you in this world that is ever pressing around. And to know that no matter what may come, no matter what may buffet us, no matter the storms of life, that it is well, that it is well with our soul. Lord, help us to look ever more to you, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.